أشرف الأعراب والعجم منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أستق فإن أستق حديث كتاب الله وخير الهج هج محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار عباد الله and indeed all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most high and exalted we praise him and we seek his help and his forgiveness and we seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the evil of our own selves and from our bad deeds whomsoever has been guided by Allah ta'ala none can misguide him and whomsoever Allah ta'ala allows to fall into misguidance none can bring him back to the guidance now be a witness that there is no true deity or God worthy of being worshipped except Allah ta'ala alone without partner or associate now further be a witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and final messenger for you who believe fear Allah ta'ala the fear that is most deserving of you and do not die unless you're in the state of Al-Islam O mankind be dutiful to your Rob your creator master and owner of all things who created you from a single soul and from it he created its mate and from them both he scattered many men and women and fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through whom you demand your mutual rights and do not cut off family ties surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an ever all watcher over you O you who believe keep your duty to Almighty Allah and fear him and always speak the truth who will direct you to do good deeds and forgive you for your sins and whosoever obeys Allah Ta'ala and his messenger alayhi salatu wasalam he's got a great success that is he'll be saved from the hellfire and made to enter into paradise as to what follows indeed the most truthful speech is the book of Allah Ta'ala the Holy Quran and the best guidance after Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the guidance of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the worst of evils are the matters which are newly invented in the religion and every newly invented matter in the religion is an innovation every innovation is a going astray and every going astray is in the hellfire Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuhu Welcome brothers and sisters to today's reading from the book The Sealed Nectar is the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, where we're up to in the book um, last week we discussed the chapter dealing with preparations for the battle of Uhud and today's chapter inshallah this will be the actual combat in that battle of Uhud and uh, as usual we'll start off with some revision questions from last week's class all about the preparations for the battle of Uhud And we'll just go to the first slide there. What was the reason for the Battle of Uhud? And this was in the aftermath of the Battle of Badr. What was the cause or what was the reason for this battle, the Battle of Uhud? Remember how the, um, the, the Quraysh, the idolaters, they had suffered a very heavy and humiliating defeat at the hands of the Muslims in the Battle of Badr. What was the reason for the next one, the battle at Uhud? Okay, alhamdulillah, Sister Um Halim has answered. Um, a Sawiq invasion, also the Makkans 
wanted revenge for Badr. Okay, so this was the main reason. Okay, it was out of revenge. The Quraysh, um, they started their preparations for war against the Muslims and basically out of revenge for their heavy and humiliating defeat in the Battle of Badr. And there's another answer there, the sisters put because of the jealousy of the Battle of Badr which they had lost. Okay, well done. So on to the next question. How did the Quraysh increase their support? Okay, the Quraysh, they were there, they were, they suffered that humiliating defeat at Badr and now they planned a big attack on the Muslims of Medina and um, uh, they had a few tactics in order to gain more support. What kind of things did they do to increase their support, to build up their numbers? How did the Quraysh increase their support in their planning for their uh, departure from Mecca to go and attack the Muslims of Medina and wipe them out. How did the Quraysh go about increasing their support? Okay, alhamdulillah, we have some answers there. Sister Sarah has answered to gather wealth to spend for the preparations for war. And Sister Um Halima has answered they forbade their people from lamenting over Badr. They hired poets to increase the sense of revenge against the Muslims. Okay, well done. They also um, they sent representatives to other Arab tribes, other surrounding Arab tribes to get support and in particular there's two tribes Kinana and Tihama these two tribes they agreed to support the Quraysh in their battle against the Muslims and as the sisters rightly pointed out there uh, the polytheists they decided to use the profits from the caravan uh, which had escaped the Muslims on the way back from Syria they used uh, wanted to use the, the profits and the money from that caravan for their war effort and again as you've answered correctly there they used the poets, they used poets and took women to the battlefield to incite the men to fight. Okay and we'll go on to the next question. How many polytheist soldiers formed the army which marched out from Mecca headed for Medina. What was the size of the Meccan Quraysh army? How many soldiers were in the army? Okay, this is uh, these are well-known facts in our history. We should know these things. How many soldiers formed the Idolater army? The Quraysh um, in the Battle of Uhud. How many soldiers were there on the disbelievers' side? Okay, we're getting a few answers there, but no, it's not the right answer. Yeah, Sister uh, Laili has answered there were more than 3,000. Okay, well done. So there were 3,000 warriors. Um, out of them, 700 had male type of armor. The 200 cavalry, that's soldiers on horseback. 3,000 camels and 15 women. 
who was their leader? Who was the leader of the Quraysh idolater army? Who was the lead? Who was their leader? Very good. Everyone knows that Abu Sufyan bin Harb and Khalid ibn Walid. He led the cavalry with Ikrama bin Abi Jahl and Banu Abdul were entrusted with the flag. Okay. Can anyone tell us who warned the Prophet about the Quraysh's preparations for war? Okay, the Prophet was in Medina. Someone came and warned him of the Quraysh's planned attack on Medina. Who was it who came to him with the warning? And um, his uncle was in Mecca at the time. He had learned of these battle preparations. So it was uncle, his uncle sent a letter to him. Who was his uncle? What was his uncle's name? Very good. Sister Sarah's answer there. Al-Abbas. Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, his uncle, he sent a letter to the Prophet وسلم, in Medina. At the time, the Prophet was... Um, he was in the masjid at Quba and he received that letter. So once he received that warning of the Quraysh's war preparations, what did he do next? Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was um, he received that letter. He was he was in the masjid at Quba. He received that warning of the Quraysh's planned attack on Medina. So what did he do after that? What did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam do? after learning of the news of the Quraysh's preparations for war. Okay, very good, Sister Um Halima has answered. The whole of Medina was put on alert. And in fact, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he convened a meeting, a meeting of the immigrants and helpers. He um, consulted with them uh, he consulted with them over safety measures to be taken for the defense of Medina and um, all men were armed even during their salah during their prayer time Okay, so after that, how did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? What plan did he have to defend the city of Medina? What plan did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam have for defending the city of Medina? When uh, the Quraysh army approached Medina, how was he going to defend Medina? Was he going to stay there? Was he going to go out? What was his plan? Okay, very good, got correct answer there. He planned to stay in Medina, okay? And another answer to meet them and not allow them to come to Medina. Anyway, Prophet وسلم, said that they should stay in the city, letting the enemy stay on the outskirts to exhaust themselves out in the open. If they entered Medina, the Muslims, then they would fight them in the roads and the entrances to the city. And uh, this was his initial plan. And who supported his plan? The Prophet وسلم, his initial plan was to stay in the city and defend the city and let the uh, Quraysh just you know wear themselves out in the open. Who supported this initial plan?
Very good, that's a correct answer there. Some hypocrites supported it because they didn't want to fight anyway. And uh, the chief amongst them was a man called Abdullah bin Ubay bin Abi Salul. He supported this plan because uh, you know he's one of the hypocrites and he didn't want to fight anyway. So who had an alternative plan? Okay, the Prophet initially wanted to defend the city uh, from within its boundaries, but uh, somebody had an alternative plan. Who was that? Who were they? Okay, Hamza wanted to go out, and um, in fact, a number of the companions who had missed the battle at Badr, they came up with the suggestion of leaving the city to meet the enemy out in the open. Okay, so what was finally decided out of these two plans? What was finally decided? Is anybody there? Yeah, alhamdulillah. Okay, they decided to go to Uhud. Very good. They decided to leave Medina to res resist the enemy out in the open, outside the city in the outskirts at Uhud Mountain. Very good. Um, can anyone tell us how did the Prophet them? How did he divide up the army? He divided up the army into a number of groups. How did he decide uh, what groups to put the people into? Okay, very good. He decided to uh, divide them up into three groups. And he put the archers on a mountain. Yes. Okay, so the first of these groups was the immigrants led by Mus'ab bin Umair. The second group was the tribe of Aus, supported um, uh, or their supporters under the command of Usaid bin Hudayr. And then there was another one, the battalion of Khazraj supporters under the command of Hubab bin Mundir. How many Muslims were in the army? How many Muslims were in the army in the Battle of Uhud? Very good. 1,000 fighters. 100 of them had armor. Okay. Well done. And uh, next question. What did the Jews want to do? The Jews, they were allied with the Khazraj tribe. So what did they decide to do once they heard that uh, the Quraysh were planning to attack Medina? What did the Jews want to do? What did they say they wanted to do? And what was the Prophet's reply to their offer? Okay, we've got an answer on the screen there. They wanted to help fight the idolaters, but the Prophet ﷺ refused their help because they were not Muslims. Well done. That's the answer I wanted. And uh, so the Prophet ﷺ and his army, they marched out. And what did they do when the Muslim army reached this place? A Khan. Okay, the Muslim army, they uh, marched out, they left the outskirts of Medina. They reached this place, Ash-Shaykhan, and well done, he paraded his army. Um, he also dismissed those who were uh, not able to fight. Yeah, very good. Um, those who were, yeah, very good, the good answers on the screen there. Um, anyone who was disabled or um, too young to fight. 
And what about these two, Rafi bin Khadaj and Samara bin Jundub? They were also very young, but the Prophet ﷺ, he allowed these two to fight. Why did he allow them to fight despite their obvious young age? Okay, got more answers on the screen there. He allowed them to fight after they wrestled and they had the skills needed to fight. Okay, very good. And Rafa, he was very skilled. He was a very skilled archer, good at shooting arrows. Well done. And Samara bin Jundub, he was, uh, he was a very strong fighter. Okay, so that's why he allowed them into the army. Why did Abdullah bin Ubay withdraw from the Muslim army? Why did Abdullah bin Ubay withdraw from the Muslim army? Yes, he was a hypocrite, but he gave a reason for leaving the army and withdrawing. What did he say the reason was? Why was he withdrawing from the army and going back to Medina? Okay, some answers there. He was a hypocrite. He said he wanted to fight in Medina and he said, why should we kill ourselves? Okay, so basically um, he said it was a protest against the Prophet wasallam. Um, because he refused to listen to his opinion of where to fight and he listened to others opinions but of course in reality he didn't even want to fight and uh, he really wanted the Muslims to lose the battle so by withdrawing at that uh, critical time in the preparations for war he wanted to create confusion and dissension amongst the Muslims um, who were, you know, uh, really concentrating on uh, those battle tactics. And another answer there, he wanted to be president again over the area of Medina. And how many people withdrew with him? Abdullah bin Ubay, he withdrew from the battle. How many withdrew with him? Okay, very good. 300 men or about one third of the size of the army so this was a large number and uh, the Prophet وسلم, he carried out a, a very clever defensive strategy using the land features to gain advantage in spite of the fact that the Muslims arrived at Uhud later than the Quraysh army and they were set and ready to fight on the seventh day of the month of Shawwal in the third Hijri year and we'll carry on our reading from the book from that point. The two parties approached and grew very close to each other. The phases of fighting started. The first combatant was the standard bearer Talha bin Abi Talha al-Abdari, who was the most distinguished idolator. He was one of the bravest men of the Quraysh fighters. And the Muslims nicknamed him the Ram of the battalion. He came forth riding a camel and challenged the Muslims to a single combat. People refrained from fighting him due to his bravery, but Azubair ibn al-Awwam advanced for the fight. He did not give the ram any chance to fight, but fell on him like a lion on his camel's back. Pulled him down to the ground and slaughtered him with his sword. Rasulullah was watching that wonderful incident exclaimed Allahu Akbar. And the Muslims exclaimed Allahu Akbar as well. He praised Azubair when he said, every prophet has a disciple and Azubair is a disciple of mine. 
Soon as the general engagement ensued and the fight of the two parties grew fierce everywhere on the battlefield, the strain of the fight was centred around the carriers of the standard, and after the death of their leader Talha bin Abi Talha, Banu Abdul Dar alternated the mission successively. Talha's brother Uthman ran forward and seized the standard which lay by the lifeless body of his brother, chanting, the standard bearer has the right to dye its shaft in blood till it be beaten in his hand. Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib attacked and dealt him a blow that cut his arm and shoulder and went down to his navel to uncover his lung. The standard was raised up again by Abu Sa'ad bin Abi Talha, but Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas shot him with a deadly arrow that hit him at his throat and made his tongue hang out, breathing his last. In another version it was narrated that Abu Sa'ad lifted the standard up and challenged the Muslims to fight him. Ali, Ali bin Abi Talib went forth and they exchanged two blows. Then Ali gave him a terminal blow that finished him off. Musafi bin Talha bin Abi Talha then hoisted the standard but was soon shot with an arrow by Aasim bin Thabit bin Abi al-Aqla. His brother Kilab bin Talha bin Abi Talha followed him, picked the banner and lifted it up. But as Zubair ibn al-Awwam attacked him and managed to kill him. Their brother al jallas bin Talha bin Abi Talha lifted the banner up but Talha bin Ubaidullah stabbed him to death. They also said that it was Asim bin Thabit who managed to deal a terminal blow to him. All those six people killed round and in defense of the standard belonged to one house, the house of Abu Talha, Abdullah bin Uthman bin Abdul Dar. Another man from Banu Abdul Dar called Artat bin Shurab Bil carried the standard but he also was killed by Ali bin Abi Talib. Others said it was Hamza who killed him and not Ali. Then it was Shuray bin Qariz who was killed by Kuzman. He was a hypocrite who fought for prestige only and not in defense of Islam. Abu Zayd Amr bin Abdul Manaf al-Abdari lifted the standard up but he was also killed by Kuzman. A son of Shurah Bil bin Hashim al-Abdari hoisted it again and was also killed by Quzman. So we see that ten fighters of Banu Abdul Dar, the standard bearers, were annihilated. Seeing that none of Abdul Dar survived to carry the standard, a slave of theirs called Sawab came to raise it. The slave showed more admirable sorts of bravery and steadfastness than his former masters. Sawab, the slave,
Assalamu alaikum. Uh, okay, yeah, we just lost the connection here, so I've rejoined and we'll carry on, inshallah. After the death of the slave Sawab, the standard fell down to the ground and remained there as there was no one to carry it. Whilst the brunt of the battle centred around the standard, bitter fighting was going on everywhere on the battlefield. The spirit of faith overwhelmed the Muslim ranks, so they rushed among the idolaters as if there had been an outbreak of a destructive flood that overflowed and knocked down all dams and barriers standing in its way. I seek death, I seek death. That was their motto on the day of Uhud. Abu Dajana, recognized by the red band round his head, came forth, fighting with the sword of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was determined to pay its price at all costs. He killed all the idolaters that stood in the way, that stood in his way, splitting and dispersing their ranks. As Zubair ibn al-Awwam said, I felt angry and discouraged when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, refused to give me the sword but gave it to Abdul, Abdul Jujana. I said to myself, I am his paternal cousin, the cousin of his aunt Sophia of Quraysh. Besides, I was the first who demanded it and yet he favoured him to me. By Allah Ta'ala, I will watch how he will use it. So I followed him and I saw him take out his red band and wear it around his head. Seeing him like that, the helper said, Abu Dujana had worn the band of death. Then he set out saying loudly, I am the one whom my intimate friend made covenant with me. Made covenant with when uh, we were under the palm trees on the mountainside. The covenant that we made was that I should not fight at the rear, but fight at the front heroically with the sword of Almighty Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No one stood in the way of, of Abu Dujana but was killed. There was a man amongst the idolaters who only, whose only target was to finish off the wounded Muslims. During the fight, Abu Dujana drew near that man, so I implored Allah Ta'ala that they might engage in combat. They in fact did and exchanged two sword strokes. The idolater struck Abu Dujana, but he escaped it and it pierced into his leather shield. The idolater's sword now stuck to it. Abu Dujana struck him with the sword and killed him. Then into the thick of the battle he rushed to kill a person who was inciting the enemy to fight the Muslims. Upon this, the person shrieked. It was a woman. Abu Dujana spared her, saying, I respect the Prophet sword too much to use it on a woman. The woman was... Hind bint Utba. Describing the same incident as Zubair bin al Awam said, I saw Abu Dujana raising a sword over the parting part of Hind bin Utba's head. Then he moved it off. I said to myself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger know best. That is, they know why he acted like that. Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib also displayed wonderful feats of gallantry against the overwhelming odds which stood unparalleled and created consternation and confusion in the disbelieving hosts. Heroes dispersed out of his way as if they had been tree leaves blown about by a strong wind. In addition to his effective contribution to the annihilation of the idolaters who stood in defense of the standard, he was even of much greater effort at fighting against men of bravery and distinguished horsemen. It was Allah Ta'ala's will that he be murdered when he was at the top. He wasn't killed in a face-to-face -face fight on the battlefield in the normal way by which heroes die, but rather assassinated in the dark of night, as was the custom of killing generous and noble men that were impossible to kill in an honorable fight. The assassination of Asadullah, the Lion of Allah Ta'ala, Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib. As for Hamza's assassination, Washi bin, Washi bin Harb described how he killed Hamza. He said, I was a slave working for Jubair bin Mut'im, whose paternal uncle, Tu'ayma bin Adi, was injured in the Battle of Badr. 
So when Quraysh marched to Uhud, Jubair said to me, If you kill Hamza, the uncle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, stealthily, you shall be set free. So I marched with the people to Uhud. He used to describe himself as, I am an adventurer, good at spearing. So when the two parties fought, I set out seeking Hamza. I saw him amidst people fighting. He was like a white and black striped camel, striking severely with a sword and no one could stand in his way. By Almighty Allah, when I was getting ready and trying to seize an opportunity to spear him, hiding sometimes behind a tree or a rock, hoping that he might draw nearer and be within range. At that moment, I caught sight of Siba bin Abdul Oza drawing closer to him. When Hamza observed him, he said, Come on, O son of the clitoris cutter, for his mother used to be a circumciser. Then he struck one strong stroke that could hardly miss his head. Wahshi said, Then I balanced my spear and I shook it until I was content with it. Then I speared him and I went down into his, it went down into his stomach and issued out between his legs. He attempted moving towards me, but he was overcome by his wound. I left him there with the spear in his entrails until he died. Then I came to him, pulled out my spear and returned to the encampment place. I stayed there and I didn't go out, for he was the only one I sought. I only killed him to free myself. So as soon as I got back to Makkah, I became a free man bringing the situation under control. Although the death of Asad, or the Lion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib, was a, a great loss, the Muslims maintained full control over the whole situation on the battlefield. On that day, Abu Bakr, Umar ibn al-Khattab, Ali bin Abi Talib, Az-Zubair ibn al-Awwam, Mus'ab bin Umair, Talha bin Ab Ubaidullah, Abdullah bin Jahsh, Sa'ad ibn Rabi'a, and Anas ibn al-Nadr and others, all of them fought so fiercely and effectively and efficiently that they broke the strong will of the idolaters and scattered them. From his wife's lap to sword fights and sorrows. One of the brave adventurers of that day was Hamdala al ghasil He was Hamdala bin Abu Amir. Abu Amir was the very monk that was nicknamed Al-Fasiq the dissolute and evildoer. Hamdala, who was newly married, left his wife's bed for al-jihad, or fight in the cause of Almighty Allah. He set out the moment he heard the call to al-jihad. When he faced the idolaters on the battlefield, he made his way through their ranks until he reached their leader, Abu Sufyan Sakhr bin Harb, and had almost killed him if he had not been ordained to be a martyr. For at that moment, he was seen by Shaddad ibn al-Aswad, who struck him to death. The contribution of the archers squad to the battle. The archers squad whom Rasulullah located on the archers mountain had the upper hand in administering the war activities to go in favor of the Muslim army. The Meccan horsemen commanded by Khalid ibn Walid supported by Abu Amir al-Fasiq had for three times attacked the left wing of the Muslim army with the aim of crushing it and then infiltrating into the rear to create a sort of confusion and disorder in the ranks of the Muslims and subsequently inflict heavy defeat on them. But thanks to the dexterity and great efforts of the archers, the three assaults were thwarted. War activities went on and on fiercely with the Muslims in full command until the idolaters finally staggered and retreated thus destroying their pride and dignity and having their standard trodden on by the feet of the fighters with none of them courageous enough to approach it. And it seemed as if the 3,000 idolaters had been fighting 30,000 Muslims and not merely several hundreds. Ibn Ishaq said, Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down his help to the Muslims and verified his promise to them. They chased the idolaters and expelled them from their camp. No doubt it was a certain defeat. An aversion by Abdullah ibn Zubair that his father had said by Allah Ta'ala, I was watching the servants of Hind bin Utbah and her woman friends fleeing with their garments gathered up. No one was there to prevent us from capturing them. And another version by Al-Burah bin Azib, 
mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari, he said, When we fought them, they fled, and their women could be seen fleeing in the mountains with their anklets and legs revealed. The Muslims pursued the enemy, putting them to sword and collecting the spoils. The archer's fatal mistake. While the small army of Muslims were recording the second absolute and clear victory over the Makkans, which was no less in splendor and glory than the first one at Badr, the majority of the archers on the mountainside committed a fatal mistake that turned the whole situation upside down and constituted a source of heavy loss amongst the Muslims. It almost brought about the murder of the Prophet and left a very bad impression on the flame and on the fame and dignity they deservedly earned at the Badr battle. In spite of the strict orders given to the archers to hold on to their position until the Prophet ﷺ sent a message to the contrary and their leaders Abdullah bin Jubair warning, 40 archers deserted their posts, enticed by the premature roar of victory as well as worldly greed for the spoils of war. The others, however, nine in number, and Abdullah, their leader, decided to abide by the Prophet's order and stay where they were until they were given permission to leave or were killed to the last. Consequently, the mountainside was left inadequately defended. The archer's fatal mistake. While the small, small army of Muslims were recording the second absolute and clear victory over the Makkans, which was no less in splendor and glory than the first one at Badr, the majority of the archers on the mountainside committed a fatal mistake that turned the whole situation upside down and constituted a source of heavy loss amongst the Muslims. And on to the next slide. The others, however, nine in number, and Abdullah, their leader, decided to abide by the Prophet's order, and they stayed there until they were given permission to, or were killed to the last, and consequently the mountainside was left inadequately defended. The Muslims consequently got trapped between two hardships. Rasulullah was then among a small group of fighters, nine in number, at the rear of the army, watching the engagement and braving the Muslim fighters. Khalid and his men took him by utter surprise and obliged him to follow either of two options. One, to flee for his life and abandon his army to the, its doomed end, or two, to take action at the risk of his life, rally the ranks of the Muslims again and work their way through the hills of Uhud towards the surrounded army. And the genius of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, his peerless and matchless courage made him opt for the second course. He raised his voice, calling out to his companions, O servants of Allah. He did that in spite of knowing that his loud voice would be heard by the idolaters before it was heard by the Muslims. He called out to them, risking his life in this delicate situation. The idolaters indeed recognized him and reached his position even before the other Muslims could do so. The surrounding of the Muslims revealed three categories of people. The first group were those who were only interested in themselves and they went so mad that they fled. They left the battlefield and did not know what happened to the others. Some of this group fled as far as Medina. Some others went up in the mountain. The second Muslim group were those who returned to the battle but mixed with the idolaters in such a way that they could not recognize one another. Consequently, some of them were killed by mistake. On the authority of al-Bukhari, he states, that Aisha radiallahu anha said, when it was Uhud battle, the idolaters were utterly defeated. Shaitan then called out, O slaves of Allah, beware the rear, that is the enemy is approaching from behind. So those who were at the front turned back and fought the ones who were behind. Then Hudayfa caught sight of his father al-Yaman about to be killed by other Muslims and so he said of servants of Allah beware this is my father this is my father Aisha radiallahu anha said but they did not part with him until he was killed Hudayfa then said 
may Allah Ta'ala forgive you. And Urwa said by Allah Ta'ala, from that time on, Hudayfa has always been blessed and wealthy until he died. That was because he forgave them and refused to take any blood money for their father for his father's murder, murder but recommended that it be spent in charity. This Muslim group suffered from great bewilderment and disorder prevailed among them. A lot of them got lost and didn't know where to go. At this awkward time, they heard someone calling, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is killed. This news made them even more bewildered and almost senseless. Their morale broke down or almost did in a great number of individuals. Some of them stopped fighting, slackened and cast down their weapons. Others thought of getting in touch with Abdullah bin Ubay, the head of the hypocrites, seeking and seeking his assistance to fetch them a security pledge from Abu Sufyan. Anas ibn Nadr passed by those people who were shuddering from fear and panic and inquired, what are you waiting for? They said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been killed. What do you live for after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Come on and die for what the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has died for. Then he said, oh Allah ta'ala, I apologize for what these people, as the Muslims, have done. And I swear disavowal of what the idolaters have perpetrated. Then he moved on until he was encountered by Sa'ad bin Mu'adh who asked him, where to Abu Amr? Anas replied, ah, how fine the scent of paradise is, I smell it here in Uhud. He went on and fought against the idolaters until he was killed. Nobody but his sister could recognize his dead body. It had been cut and stabbed by over 80 wounds, arrows or spears. It was by the tip of his finger that she, after the battle, recognized him. Thabit ibn Dada called unto his people saying, O kinsfolk of helpers, if Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were killed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everlasting and he never dies. Fight in defense of your faith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you and so you will be victorious. A group of helpers joined him and all set out and attacked a battalion of Khalid's horsemen. He kept on fighting until he and his friends were killed. An immigrant passed by a helper who was besmeared by blood and he said, O oh fellow, have you heard of Muhammad's murder? The helper answered, if Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were killed, then he must have completed the delivery of the message. So fight in defense of your religion. With such boldness and encouragement, the Muslims soon recovered their spirits, came round to their senses and gave up the idea of surrender or contacting the hypocrite Abdullah bin Ubay. They took up arms and resumed the fight, attempting to make way to the headquarters, particularly after the news of the Prophet's death had been falsified. The glad tidings nerved them and helped them to manage quite successfully the break of the military blockade and concentrate their forces in an immune place to resume a relentless and fierce fight against the polytheists. The third group of Muslims were those who cared for nothing except the Prophet wasallam. At the head of them were notable companions like Abu Bakr, Umar ibn al-Khattab, Ali ibn Abi Talib and others. May Allah be pleased with all of them who hastened to protect the Prophet through unrivaled devotion. As those groups of Muslims were receiving the blows of the idolaters and resisting instantly, the fight flared up around the Messenger of Allah وسلم, who had only nine people around him. As soon as he called out to the Muslims, come on, I am the Messenger of Allah وسلم, the idolaters heard his voice and recognized him. So they turned back and attacked him with all, all of their power <coughs> before any of his companions ran to his aid. A violent, raging struck, uh, struggle broke out between the nine Muslims and the idolaters during which unequaled sort of love, self-sacrifice, bravery and heroism were revealed. Imam Muslim on the authority of Anas bin Malik 
narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam along with seven helpers and two emigrants was confined to a trap when the idolaters attacked him. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then said, He who pushes back these idolaters will be housed in paradise or he will be my companion in paradise. One of the helpers stepped forward and fought the idolaters in defense of the Prophet ﷺ until he was killed. Then they attacked the messenger ﷺ again. The same process was repeated again and again until all of the seven helpers were killed. Then the messenger of Allah ﷺ said to his two Quraysh companions, we have not done justice to our companions. The last of those seven helpers was Amara bin Yazid ibn Saqqan, who, was, who kept on fighting until his wounds neutralized him and he fell down dead. The most awkward hour in the Messenger's life. After the fall of ibn Saqqan, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, remained alone with only those two Qurayshites. In a version by Abu Uthman, authorized in a Sahihain, he said, at that time there were none with the Prophet وسلم, except Talha bin Ubaidullah and Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas. That was the most awkward and dangerous hour for the Prophet وسلم, but it was a golden opportunity for the idolaters who promptly took advantage of it. They concentrated their attack on the Prophet وسلم, and looked forward to killing him. Utba bin Abi Waqqas pelted him with stones. One of the stones fell on his face. His lower right incisor tooth was injured. His lower lip was wounded. He was also attacked by Abdullah bin Shihab al Zuhri who cut his forehead. Abdullah bin Kam'iya, who was an ab obstinate, strong horseman, struck him violently on his shoulder with his sword, and that stroke hurt the Messenger of Allah وسلم, for over a month though it was not strong enough to break his two armors. He dealt a heavy blow on his cheek. It was so strong that two rings of his iron-ringed helmet penetrated into his holy cheek. Take this stroke from me. I am Ibn Kamir, and he said while striking the messenger with his sword, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, replied while he was wiping the blood flowing on his face, I implore Allah Ta'ala to humiliate you. In Al-Bukhari it stated his incisor tooth broke, his head was cut and that he started wiping the blood off it saying, I wonder how can people who cut the face of their Prophet وسلم, and break the incisor tooth of his he who calls them to worship Allah Ta'ala, how can such people thrive or be successful? About that incident, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala sent down a Quranic verse saying, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem Layasa daka minan amrika shay'un awa yatukoba arayhim awa yu'adhibahum fa'innahum zalimun not for you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but for Allah ta'ala is the decision. Whether he turns in mercy to pardon them or punishes them. Verily, they are the zalimun, the polytheists, disobedience and wrongdoers. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah ta'ala's wrath is great on those who besmear the face of his messenger. He observed silence for a short while, then resumed saying, O oh Allah Ta'ala, forgive my people, for they have no knowledge. In Sahih Muslim, it stated, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, My Lord, forgive my people, for they have no knowledge. In Ash-Shifa, a book by Ayyad Al-Qadi, it's related, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, O oh Allah Ta'ala, guide my people, for they have no knowledge. It's quite certain that killing the Prophet وسلم, was their primary aim. But the two Qurayshites, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and Talha bin Ubaidullah, who showed great and rare courage and fought so fiercely and boldly that though they were only two, 
they were able to stop the idolaters realizing their aim. They were of the best skill for Arab archers and kept on fighting in defense of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until the whole squad of idolaters were, was driven off him. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam emptied his quiver of arrows and said to Sa'ad Sa ibn Abi Waqqas, Shoot an arrow, Sa'ad. May my father and mother be sacrificed for you. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had never gathered his parents except in the case of Sa'ad, a privilege granted to him for his efficiency. In a version by Jabir, authorized by an nasai concerning the attitude of Talha bin Ubaidullah, towards the gathering of idolaters around the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when there were only some helpers with him, Jabir said, when the idolaters reached him, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, who will suffice us their evils, that is fight back? Talha said, I will. When all of the helpers were killed, Talha proceeded forward to fight as much as the other eleven ones did until his hand was hurt and his fingers were cut off. So he said, Be they cut off. The Prophet wasallam said, If you had said in the name of Allah, the angels would have raised you up before the people's very eyes. Then he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala drove the idolaters off them. Talha had sustained thirty-nine or thirty-five wounds and his fingers, that is the forefinger and the one next to it, got paralyzed. In a version by Qais bin Abi Hazim, he said, I saw the hand of Talha paralyzed. That was because he protected the Prophet ﷺ with it in the Uhud battle. Tirmidhi stated, the Prophet ﷺ then said about Talha, he who desires to see a martyr walking on the ground, let him look at Talha bin Ubaidullah. Abu Dawud at Tayalisi on the authority of Aisha radiallahu anha said whenever Uhud day that is the battle was mentioned Abu Bakr used to say that was Talha's day that is the battle Abu Bakr recited a verse of poetry about him Al Talha bin Ubaidullah paradise is due to you as water springs are due to deer to drink out of At the most critical time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down his invisible help. Sa'ad said, I saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on Uhud day with two men, dressed in white, defending him fiercely. I have never seen similar to them, neither before Uhud nor after it. Another version, he means to say that they were Jibril and Mikhail. All those events happened in no time. If the Prophet Sallallahu elite companions had realized the grave situation immediately, they would have rushed on the spot and would not have...